Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So, if you guys don't know Jeff Gale, what a JMG Reptiles, you guys need to. I'm standing in his facility right now here in Ohio. So, Jeff literally breeds hundreds of hog noses, some morphs that have never been seen before, and he is the originator of the Arctic and the Super Arctic, and most of the Arctic morphs out there. And he's about to give us a tour of his hog nose breeding facility. I'm Dave Kaufman, and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild. And while I'm at it, checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation, and conservation. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Zilla, we are dedicated to the innovation of caging, lighting, and equipment solutions that provide proper husbandry for your pet's long and happy life. To see our entire catalog, visit ZillaRules.com. All right, Jeff, I have never seen so many hog noses in one collection before, and this is, this is incredible. So I don't even know where to begin. Let's just start with what you got there. This is a really nice example of an Arctic morph right here. And this is the single copy version, the heterozygous visual of an Arctic. And it's characterized by like a really gray silver background. And as you can see, there's a lot of green in the saddles. It may not show up as clearly like on the camera, but it is pretty green. And you have a, a lot of nice white highlights a nice real black belly with uh, the yellows kind of muted. It's highly variable and it also depends on what you breed it to. If you breed it to a red phase, they'll come out a little more brownish and they typically aren't gonna be as like, you know, have saddles that are as green. And that's a red phase Arctic right there. And as you can see, the saddles really aren't green, uh, but she actually has a lot of black uh, saturation in her saddles, right. which is actually another distinguishing factor for Arctics. A lot of them will have black concentration somewhere around her saddles and they'll have a lot of nice white markings around her face. And it looks like she's starting to go into shed and she definitely is. Yeah, so yeah, she's not that. looking as crisp as she normally is, but you can see she has that really nice white background and those nice burgundy saddles. Where did the Arctic come from? You're, you were the originator. Yes. And so where did it come from? How did you develop it? Well, originally it came from uh, my Lemon Ghost project and I had this nice gray uh, light colored female and I bred my one lemon ghost male to it, and I got, um, and that's what I was calling it at the time. At the time, I was like a young teenager, and I got some nice yellow face ones. And um, some, of, some of them has some nice highlights, a little more white coloration. And when I bred one of those back to one of my original lemon ghosts, I popped out a super arctic. And then through more selective breeding, I realized that the arctic gene was separate from the lemon ghost, and the lemon ghost was just a line bred color mutation or just a line bred uh, trait that was masking the arctic. So when did the arctic gene first pop up? How long ago was it? Uh, it's kind of like a complicated question to answer because I didn't really realize what I had until I was like maybe maybe about 13, 15 years ago and I probably had it before then, probably four or five years before then. Like yeah. I, probably, I got my first arctic and it was because basically when I was young um, I was real into genetics and I like colored mutations and stuff like that. So I was actually interested in hognose snakes and actually the variable, like, you know, color mutations that were available, which there weren't many. There's hypo, pastel pink, and albino. Right. And there was like red face too and some light colored ones. And I couldn't afford albinos, hypos, or pastel pinks because I was, you know, around like nine, ten years old when I was first buying hognose. Right, right. So um, I would just buy any weird looking normal that I could find or anything I thought was like a little different and then start breeding it. <laughs> and that's kind of like how it started. And so mm -hmm. actually I had my original Arctic. I probably picked it up when I was like 11 years old. Nice. Well, and that's, then, that's and, where most of the morphs come from is by this yeah. one looks different. This one looks different. Let's yeah, kind of tinkering yeah. with it and right. see what happens. Right. Yep. So about 15 years ago is when you first noticed it. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Wow, I didn't think they were that old. No, it just took me a long time to get it like yeah. uh, kicked off and everything. Right. So how many different morphs have you produced of the Arctic? Um, good question. I mean, I've incorporated into a lot of other genes. Like I have sable arctics, albinos, toffee, uh, lavender, uh, then condas, and then conda mix with pretty much all those traits. And I also have hets. And uh, so, you know, a decent amount, over a dozen probably. This is an Arctic sable. The Arctic is very, very uh, highly variable and it's also highly variable in the sable. Like this one has a lot of muted uh, coloration and- Man, your hog noses really love you. They do. And she has like a really white background. It has like this weird like hue over it. Yeah. And nice dark saddles of like green coming through. Look at that, that is awesome. Let me see that belly. It's got the sable belly. Uh, the iridescence is really high with the sables and it really reacts well with the arctic and you can see it in the pink cheeks on this arctic sable female right here. All right, this one caught my eye when I first came in. 
This is an Arctic Sunburst, so it's a double visual sable albino with the Arctic gene. Look at that. You got the twin spotting going on there? Yeah, yeah, you have a lot of like uh, crazy colors too. A lot of like uh, pinks and oranges, kind of like Sherbert. And you even get some like yellow greenish flares on the saddles. Yeah, definitely. Look at that. All right, so if you were to sell this snake, what would the value of this snake be? Well, she's not for sale, but if I had to put a, a number, probably like 7,500. 7,500? Yeah. Yeah. This is an Arctic Anaconda Sable. And uh, the Arctic and Sable actually, it, well, I showed you the one Arctic Sable, and she's a variation of the Arctic Sable, but some Arctic Sables, actually a good majority of them, turn very dark early on. So yeah. the Arctic gene is actually really cool um, for incorporating into Sable because a lot of people like Sables because of all the dark, mm -hmm. rich coloration. And so the Arctic really accelerates that yeah, uh, sure does. blackness. Right here we have a Super Arctic, and this is just a regular Super Arctic. Um, no other genes, just... Uh, just a visual homozygous arctic and it makes a super form right here so vibrant and such you know high contrast and they have the solid black eyes they have very nice contrast of black and white just really stands out on them you yeah. get the nice tiger kind of like zebra pattern a lot so how much are super arctics going for nowadays super arctics um babies around like nine hundred dollars um my sub adults and bigger ones around like fourteen to eighteen hundred dollars so they're still holding a, a price they them. are yeah, yeah they are um they're definitely um a must-have if you're doing a lot of you know color mutations of uh, hog nose and combinations yeah and the super arctics just by themselves are very striking like you said and just really popular just because their overall look and they look like an animal that would have multiple genes in them but they don't you know it's just right a, exactly yeah, right it's just a super arctic and yeah yeah it's like some people even say they like regular super arctics compared to a lot of super arctic combos is because it's hard just to beat just a good clean nice looking super arctic i agree and we're trying to eat meat now do again. all your hog noses like to you know have you for lunch not all of them but uh a lot of my sub adults once they start getting their nice growth spurts and their appetites increase right yeah they kind of start to associate me with food look at that <laughs> well you are food now yep <laughs> so how often are you feeding these guys um every five to eight days it depends okay. and you know as they you know increase like the like their um their metabolism goes up and their growth spurts hit i might start feeding them every four or five days. every four or five days yeah okay. and then like typically i'm doing probably more like six to eight days i don't like to sure. get like a like a straight pattern i kind of like to well give them a variable like kind of like a schedule and also smaller meals they seem to grow um, a little more evenly they don't get too big and they seem to um, breed better and have a longer longevity overall right this is a super arctic super conda and this is a really uh, busy one it's got a lot of coloration going on yeah and look at that look at the belly color coming up over the edges there yep you got a lot of like translucent scales and like uh just shattered pattern wow all right, so you were saying that because it's a superconda, generally speaking, supercondas are patternless. patternless snakes, but this one has the back stripe to it, and is that caused by the super arctic? Exactly. The super arctic increases the uh, melanin production like drastically. That's why you see such sharp, strong black. And if you look at a lot of supercondas, a lot of times they have a hint of like a stripe down their back that's real faint. So there is like still some pigmentation coming through, and the super arctic just makes that all pop. So, but not all superconda super arctics are this stripe, but this one in particular is. Is, uh, heavily saturated. That's a coral. This is an albino lavender, so a double uh, visual recessive. So you got the lavender gene and albino both expressed. Look at her stand up like a little cobra. <laughs> yeah, she's doing, yeah, she's looking, she's yeah. posing. And it kind of ends up looking like a snow, but with a lot more pink saturation. Yeah, and I think the eyes are a little bit more pink in this. They thing. are, they are. They're snow. definitely, their eyes are definitely more pink and red. They seem to glow more. All right, so. Here we have a lavender and a lavender arctic. Yes, here's a lavender arctic right here in my left hand, and then I got a regular lavender right here. So re regular lavender here, arctic, arctic lavender, lavender yep. squirreling away over there. Let's see if we can get a good comparison. Yeah. You can see this one's got like more silvery uh, background and more highlights. It's got more of like a gray bluish head. Yeah, a lot more uh, diffused coloration. Yes, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Wow, those are two unbelievable snakes. And they call these moon dust, the Arctic lavender. The Arctic lavender is called what? A moon dust. Moon dust? Yeah. I've never heard that before. I have just learned something. How many people would you say have the lavender Arctic? Eight. Eight? Ten? Maybe 10 or 12. No, probably a little more. Maybe like, yeah, maybe like 15 people. Okay, so yeah. about 15 people in the world actually have a lavender arctic probably around there could yep. be a couple more than you know not aware of Some right, people, right. Like, people hatched out a few this year sure a couple like two years ago there was like three people there. right i was just gonna yeah. say i don't think that i've heard about a lot of people having those this is a sunburst it's uh albino sable so two recessives right here 
And this is a really, really pretty one, really good example. Wow, it sure is. You get a lot of greens and yellows and pinks and oranges showing up there. Like, you got a lot of orange and pink on the side. Look at that. And it's almost like a reverse albino, because normally you'd see, like, the saddles are more orange, like on a regular albino. Right, right. So it's kind of like having that reverse effect. But look at the, I mean, the, the saddles are almost just kind of outlines. Yes. They're not solid. Yeah, yeah, they're not real apparent. Like, in person, if you look real closely, especially around the neck, it's like, okay, they're more visible. Right. But yeah, from a distance, if you've seen this from a distance, you would say, hey, it's like a solid yellow snake. But right. All right, cool. Let's get, uh, this is neat. This is an Arctic albino. And it's also het sable. But this is a really nice Arctic albino. Really white background, lots of limey green, yellow, uh, you know, coloration on her saddles. Wow, she is nice. That's almost like yellow green. Yeah. If there is such a thing, but it is. Okay, we're going to look at uh, Super Arctic Toffee. Yeah. I think that's a good one. Because uh, the toffee gene, like we're kind of talking, is a little underappreciated. It's very under underappreciated. These used bit. to be the hottest morph, and then all of a sudden... They were. When they were first on the market, they were like $3,000. Right. Like, yeah, you couldn't even keep them, um, like, you know, like, you know, of, like available long. They would just sell. Um, and there's still a really uh, important mutation, and they're really cool. Um, and it reacts really well with Super Arctic. I mean, you can see this right now, especially yeah. on the saddles. you got a lot of pink. Um, and it's just very different looking. And what's the belly on this one look like? Oh, wow. Got a nice, like, puce color. Yeah, it sure does. And so we move up the scale, and we've got a Arctic Toffee Anaconda. And it looks really, really good because uh, the Arctic and Toffee react really well because a lot of toffees get that kind of, like, greenish yellow. You know, right. and that's the cool thing about toffees. You get a lot of variation. You can get, like, the brownish, rusty colored ones. You get the orange ones, reddish ones, and you can get, like, the yellow and greenish ones. And Arctics, like you've seen in the first uh, Arctic we looked at, had... A lot of green yeah in its sale so it really makes a lot of the toffees with uh, combined with the arctic pop more of like a yellow greenish color and the anaconda even emphasizes that more and gives it uh you know of course the anaconda gives it the distorted pattern right um, well look at that green coming out. yeah and it's just like yeah it's just a really good combination those three together got a lot of greens yellows really cool pattern that is amazing yeah and it's really unique compared to other hognose morphs there's really no other hognose morph that looks like you know that i'd say similar to this i would agree so this is an arctic lavender conda correct Whew. yeah that's pretty cool she's got the or he has the nice soft uh gray silver like lavender tones and there's a lot of pinks in there it's kind of like a light puce we say we'll, we'll go with puce again puce. <laughs> a real pale puce it's an ugly pink. color but it's fun to say yeah but there's like silver mixed in there, and it's yeah, uh, just like really, really good looking. Whoa. And uh, I'm going to try to use this guy here to try to make some uh, moonstone anacondas and moonstone superconda's. And the moonstone is the super arctic lavender. So that's what this guy is going to be used in my breeding projects for to potentially produce. Cool. He's got a really cool belly. It's yeah, like look silver. At that belly. Whoa. Looks like it was colored by a paint pen, like a, one of those silver paint pens. Yeah, yeah. So. I see Super Daddy up here. I gotta see this guy. Oh, look at that. So this is the Super Daddy. Yep. This is a Super Arctic, Super Anaconda, albino. Man, look at that. He almost has like a stripe down his back, but look at that belly. It's almost, it almost has like a lavender belly. Yes. All right, you're gonna get me back into hog noses for sure. That's okay, actually. Oh yeah, yeah. That's a good way to get a All face. right, so there's another one munching on you. Yep. Yep, yep, good, good. But it's a good way to see his face, though, so that's good. It is. It's a really yeah. good way to get him to hold yeah, still. Yeah, and, and to see that, you know, that lateral stripe down his back. That's good. You know, this is the way to film hognose. You know, get him distracted, and then you can... Either feed him yourself or a mouse. Right. we got to talk about this, because a lot of people out there think that these are rear fanged venomous, and that if you get bit, your hand is going to swell up, you're going to get a reaction. You've just been bit by, what, 20 snakes just uh, doing this, yeah. and, and and no reaction. Well, for one, they have to chew on you for a while to secrete it, because they don't have hollow fangs, and so it's going to take a little while. Some go a little quicker. It also depends, because I see some people, they're like, you know, I've been chewed on a hog, and I have no reactions. I get both. I'll get chewed on by hog nose and I'll have no reaction. Sometimes I'll have a reaction. And it's not so much it's about how much like, you know, saliva is going into right. it. It's about how the hog nose chewed on me. So some of these people are having not having reactions. They're probably not letting one chew on them for a long period of time. Uh, the people that are having these really nasty reactions are letting them chew on them for like three to five minutes. And I shouldn't really say letting. They just don't know how to properly remove them. Remove them, right. And the thing is, like, when you label them, they're like mildly venomous. A lot of times they'll scare some people because they'll be... That's exactly that's it. That's the problem with labeling them like that because you can have, like, you know, spiders are all venomous. And, you know, most of them are completely harmless. And right. hognose is extremely harmless. And you could... Um, and even people that have nasty reactions to the Western hognose bites, 
could get no reactions as long as they remove the hog nose right away. Right, right. If you know how to remove them right away, then that's the, the first step. And the thing is, hog nose um, really aren't a really good comparison to other species and how to like remove a snake. Because like you know, I've seen other people get bit by snakes and they run them underwater and they're like, that's real effective. Hog nose, especially a feeding response, they're not that apt to give up sometimes. And you sometimes you can do all those other right. tricks for other species and the hog nose won't let go. Right. So the one thing I do with the hog nose is that I, like the big go-to is I just lift up firmly on the rostral scale and they just slowly come off. Because the rear fangs are their largest teeth and aside from that, their other teeth are very small. Right. And they're very easy to unhook. Right. So the other you know side of the coin is is that uh, you know some people are actually allergic to you know the saliva of a hog nose, and I think that that has compounded yeah. the reaction that they've gotten. That can be yeah. There, there's always going to be somebody that's going to have a worse reaction than uh, anybody else. Right. Whatever you do though, don't p yank them off. Yeah. Don't yank them off. Don't run yeah. them underwater. Don't like put alcohol or peroxide in their mouth. Right. Um, you know, even though you know it may not you know do long-term damage it's not healthy for the snake and, right you know flooding the animal's mouth with water and possibly getting in its glottis and everything probably isn't good and the thing is they use their rostral scale to dig you know you've seen them mm -hmm. they dig through like sand and yeah. like you know like you know uh loose soil or some of the times the soil is actually pretty uh, uh tough with a lot of stones in it their rostral scale is like you know made to be a big strong plow and it's backed by a pretty thick bone so when you pull up on it you're not hurting them right no you're not because when you pull them up a lot of times um i'll actually get bit the most of the times i'm getting bit is when i'm feeding right because that's right makes sense well nine know? times out of ten it's a food response yes, these aren't be. aggressive at all no no they, they don't bite out of defense their head design doesn't really allow like you right. know they, they, they have curved rear fangs they got boxy heads um and that's why they bluff their, their mouths really aren't designed sometimes they'll do the open mouth uh uh, you know, the gate, the right. mouth gate where they throw it. That, right. They'll have that Look at me, I'm big and scary. Yeah. Leave me alone. Right. Yeah, but when you right. um, get bit by them, it's always going to be a feeding response, and that's when you get those like uh, you know, hog nose chewing on you and everything. Right. And exactly right. That, that rostral scale is super strong, so it's okay to lift up on it and just slowly remove them like that. Cool. This is a Sub-Zero, a Super Arctic Albino. So Super Arctic and Albino, and with all that black removed from the Super Arctic, you can see there's a lot of other pigmentation yeah. underneath that saturated black, and that's a lot of pink. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how you breed these guys and what your methodology is for them. Sure. Um, well, I cool mine down. Uh, ideally in the winter but sometimes my schedule gets a little messed up and i have some other uh things that may cause me to cool them down later but uh, i like to cool my western hognose down to around 55 to 62 degrees and i've even found cooling them at even 65 degrees is uh good is that and, yeah, yeah and i get uh, good results and i cool them for usually seven eight weeks at the shortest and maybe like 10 12 weeks at the longest usually around a two two and a half three months range is good um two months though i found is good enough and I slowly warm them uh, back up and start offering meals about two weeks after cool down. Some may not start eating right away, some may take three weeks. And once they've had a good four meals, um, smaller meals, I start to introduce the males with the females. And uh, one uh, really good advice I can give you is don't get your hog nose real warm after uh, cool down because that will increase your metabolism uh, a lot quicker and then sometimes it'll make them develop egg follicles really quick and you can miss an ovulation. And then also uh, the high temperatures can also um, uh, skew their fertility or make their right. fertility weaker. I keep like my adult breeder males around like 80 to 84 degrees and I try not to uh, keep them in excess of 84. And my adult, uh, my females, um, as I'm feeding them in the spring, it seems to be okay to get them up to 87, 88. Um, it's just really the males I focus on just kind of keeping them in the lower temperature range. What I used to do when I bred hog noses was I would pair them up in the fall then put them down for brumation, then pair them up in the spring. You ever do that? Um, I have when I was younger, and I've done it, but I, I, it's a good way of success. And they've actually found hognose do that in the wild. I've they seen found, them breed in the wild in yeah, the fall, in the yeah. the fall, like, because the thing is, you have, like, the reverse season. Right, And right. those females can retain sperm, especially in the cold uh, weather, so... Um, it just ensures their fertility probably in the wild for them to breed in the fall then again in the spring So it's definitely a good method and it's an interesting method and it's definitely one that I would never oppose and right. it could actually increase your fertility and all that you can incubate them at 85 um it's a, you'll get them to hatch pretty quick but i ideally like to incubate around 80 to 82 and sometimes yeah. I do as high as 83 and um i've actually had some hog eggs go up to 86 87 and they just hatch really really quick right i used to do 84 <laughs> yeah okay yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a 
completely okay. I, uh, I just kind of like the little slower, um, just because they usually hatch out with a little like uh, uh, a little larger. They absorb the yolk sac a little more slowly, evenly. I've right. incubated them as low as 78 with success, and I've done it as high as 86. And I didn't really notice a huge difference though between my ones at like 79 and 86. Right. Not a big difference. If you have like big healthy eggs, you're gonna get big babies regardless if you're doing them at like say 85 or like 80. Degrees. Right. Right. All right. So there's a snake that doesn't need an introduction. That is a Lucy. That is a leucistic hognose. What is this one, about uh, a couple months old? Yep. Yeah, she's got a uh, paradox blotch right. Oh, look at that. She on a rostral scale, on a couple of her prefrontal scales. Where did this one come from? I bought a pair of hets from my friend uh, Brent and uh, raised them up and bred them, and I got some poor odds I only hatched out one. I should have probably hatched oh, out a few no. from my number of eggs I got, but I, luckily I got at least one. I mean, yeah. could have got zero. Absolutely. Especially Absolutely. from my head-to-head -head breeding. Absolutely. No, these are amazing. So let's talk a little bit about age. You sure. know, hog noses have been bred for years and years and years now. And so what is the maximum age for a male and a female to keep breeding? Um, I think males will breed almost all the way till their full life expectancy uh, lives out. And I've had 12 year old males that were still very fertile and very good breeders. Um, and I've had females breed up until 10, 12 years old. And actually I had, uh, my oldest female I ever bred successfully was 12 years of age. And I think the um, smaller, if you give them smaller meals and you keep them a little uh, smaller, you don't get them, uh, you know, obese or oversized too quickly, their longevity will be uh, longer and so are their fertility and right. just overall animal's healthiness. So that's the thing. As long as the animal's really healthy, um, they can, can, you know, still produce. And I think the one issue, you know, hog nose fed in captivity, mice, that's not really what they're supposed to be a staple diet of mice. Sure. Even though they can live on it and it's not necessarily that bad for them. It's easily it's easy to give them too much though, and that influx of food can um, you know cause extra fat stores yep. and also speed up other things in their aging process. Because I've noticed when you get females, well, with a lot of people, if you get females, like I've seen people get females up to five, seven hundred grams in two and a half, three years, and generally ninety some percent of those are more make horrible breeders That's and right. don't even produce fertile eggs. That's right. Small percentage will, but um, and if you raise them and they get big slowly over a, a period of time they're that's a lot uh, better way and they're, they usually still stay pretty fertile um but you know a lot of hog nose it seems like in captivity they're living into their like late teens seems to be the average kind of lifespan right I've that's heard what of, i've seen too yeah and i've heard of like 22 years and i think that's the uh one like a record that's uh you know out there for that's the age extreme though yeah that yeah. That, that i've heard of i heard 22 years is the maximum length and i'm sure they could live up to 25 possibly yeah you know a lot of you guys may know that i started out breeding hognose snakes hognose snakes are one of my favorite snakes and one of the downside about doing this channel and touring all over is that i really had to downsize my collection when i'm out of town all the time and unfortunately all of my hog noses they were sold and i regret it every single day. So for me to come over here to Jeff's place and see some of the morphs that he's working with, morphs that I've never seen before, I really have to get back into hog noses, but that doesn't mean I'm gonna stop making these videos. So Rattlers, I want you guys to comment below and let me know what your favorite hog nose that you saw over here at JMG Reptiles was. Also like this video and share this video. Say hi to the dog barking up there. Also check out our sponsors links, they're in the description below. Of course, hit that subscribe button when you do, hit that bell so you never miss an upload. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on. <laughs>